Should we start? Um, so I'm here to talk about multi-cloud CI/CD with uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes. Um, before I start with the content, I'll present myself. I'm uh, Maxime. I'm a cloud consultant. I help um, people uh, with their public and private cloud projects. Uh, usually a combination of uh, OpenStack, Kubernetes, uh, Ceph, and CI/CD to um, put it all together. Um, so this is what I do, and that's enough about me. We can uh, get into the interesting stuff. Um, so the talk is about multi-cloud. So first, I'll um, cover a little bit about uh, what I mean by multi-cloud. Maybe different people mean different things, and uh, why um, you might be interested in uh, doing multi-cloud. So uh, one of the main motivation is oh, maybe uh, one of the main thing of multi-cloud is to run in several clouds, right? So instead of running in a single provider, to run into several uh, clouds, possibly provided by different uh, companies. Um, so that's like the, what I mean by multi-cloud, kind of loosely uh, defined uh, thing. Um, why do you want to do that? In a lot of cases, it's about resiliency. Um, you want to cover uh, situations where uh, one cloud has issues, and you, you want to, to still have your application or your workload to work, so you, you, you have the second cloud to third clouds or other clouds to, to cover for that. So there's like a big uh, resiliency aspect uh, with the multi-cloud. Um, there are also vendor lock-ins uh, considerations. Maybe uh, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you, you might have a great relationship with uh, one company, but uh, who knows, maybe uh, they will get uh, acquired by a competitor, or maybe they will just uh, go out of business or something like this. So it's nice to be prepared and already have uh, uh, other cloud infrastructure in place, so you can just flip a switch and, uh, and move on. Um, so there's that. There's also uh, the cost considerations. Uh, maybe that uh, some providers uh, all of a sudden they decide to increase prices or they uh, do something like this. Uh, well, you, you, you might want to, to leverage other cloud providers uh, kind of on the fly uh, without too much hassle, without like a huge migration from cloud A to cloud B. Um, that cost aspect ties a little bit with the uh, hybrid cloud aspects. Um, lots of people want to do uh, a private cloud workload, a private cloud deployment that handles your baseline workload, and then uh, cloud bursting into a public cloud provider to handle those bursts. That way you can be very cost effective on your uh, baseline uh, load and handle uh, seasonal traffic, might be holiday season, something like this, uh, into a public cloud provider that has more um, capacity to handle those short-lived uh, bursts, and that's uh, like definitely a cost motivation. Could be some things around features, maybe uh, your uh, different cloud providers have different features, some of them they have a Magnum, some of them they have Octavia, some of them they have uh, this and that, and you maybe don't find the cloud provider that has you know, all the things that you want, so maybe you need to mix and match uh, a bit some things here, something there. Um, and it can also be something around the locations, um, like the, the giants, they, they have a set of locations and those locations, they might fit you or they might not fit you. Maybe your application is very latency sensitive and you need to, to have something like very close to your uh, end users and this is where uh, having like a edge computing situation or having some different locations can be interesting compared to what's offered by the, 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 big, the big guys, let's say. Um, so that's that for the multi-cloud part. So multi-cloud CI-CD, so why do we want to even do CI-CD? The main thing is to fail fast. We don't want to involve like lots of work to realize that our uh, new patch will fail. So we want to like get really quick feedback that, oh, there's something wrong here. Maybe uh, there's a typo somewhere or something like that. Uh, things don't work out. We didn't invest a lot of time with uh, involving the ops team or something like that. So it's really about that, like uh, having the automation in place so you can uh, like realize that. Um, in a multi-cloud context, it's a lot about the, the, the consistency as well, that if you have lots of locations, it's really important to, to have automation in place to make sure you're consistent across locations. If you have humans uh, involved in setting those things, you'll very likely end up in having slight differences <coughs> a bit here. Uh, another person did this other location and made a typo or a little 
fog or something, and then you, you end up in situations where it's difficult to troubleshoot those uh, differences and see, oh, it doesn't work. And this other cloud uh, region that we have. So that's the other motivation for CI, CD, and why it's important when you, you have lots of locations to, 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 to leverage that. Um, and then the last part of the, the title is OpenStack and Kubernetes. Um, so OpenStack here uh, will be the API-driven infrastructure. Like if we want to do automation, we, we need to have like APIs or easy ways to, to automate things to, to, to set up the infrastructure. We can't rely on uh, sending tickets to, to people to, to get things happening. So that's not going to work for the CIs. That's really important to have like an API-driven infrastructure. Um, OpenStack will provide the open infrastructure that will allow to, to not be dependent on a single uh, organization, like we we are a community, so uh, lots of organizations are involved, and we are not depending on a single cloud provider. So that uh, gives a flexibility around the resiliency and the vendor lock-in. Uh, and also, OpenStack has a huge uh, marketplace of uh, public cloud providers. There are around 60 AZs available, uh, listed on uh, OpenStack website for uh, for uh, companies <coughs> providing public cloud services. So most likely, there is one that's uh, close to you or uh, has uh, features that you might be interested in. Um, and the Kubernetes part is to provide a container ecosystem to have something very developer-centric. Uh, developers that will have uh, most likely be familiar with Docker, so there's a good interaction there. Um, something like to make the application deployment portable and uh, be able to reproduce things uh, fairly easily between different locations. Uh, we don't want to have uh, problems with uh, it works in cloud A but doesn't work in cloud B. Right? So that's kind of important. That's like the, the, the topic. Uh, and then like in the overview, uh, like visual visualization of this is that you'll have your users um, talking to your app and your app will consume Kubernetes and Kubernetes will consume OpenStack. So that's like really your data plane where your um, users will uh, will work, so when you have a request, it goes kind of on the left. And you, on the right-hand side, you have uh, what I will call the, the, the control plane, where your um, DevOps will uh, work, they will talk to your CI, and then the CI will make things happen in the data plane, maybe, maybe they'll update some things in the application, uh, maybe it will uh, do some things in Kubernetes and do some things in OpenStack, um, but it's not involved in every single request uh, your users are making, like, to, to really separate like control plane, data plane. Um, so app is business logic, Kubernetes container platform, and OpenStack, the infrastructure as a service. That's really like the, the overview of the multi-cloud thing. Um, to go a little bit more in detail into the architecture, how can we make this happen in, in, in uh, real life? And I'm going to present like one way to do it. Uh, and it's, uh, there are several ways to do it, and uh, if you have another way that works best for you, you know, that's fine. Uh, and we can uh, talk about uh, uh, different uh, options. So your users will open a browser and they'll uh, try to reach application and the first thing they'll do, they enter like, the URL. So that's kind of like the entry point of the whole thing. Uh, you're going to need some form of DNS name and, and from there, your, your DNS name will need to, to be able to like load balance between your uh, mm -hmm. cloud regions. Uh, and that's what I call the global load balancing. You kind of have two options there. You could either go with a CDN, and you might already be using a CDN, and then you know, it's uh, probably easier. Um, or you could go with something uh, at the DNS level to, to, to load balance between your regions. Uh, so there you can uh, do some uh, geo-routing with uh, either Route 53 or DIN, I think. Uh, some uh, DIY scripts that would update your DNS records dynamically, maybe based on uh, some monitoring information. Uh, or you could do some uh, dead simple uh, round robin uh, DNS. Uh, kind of different options there for the global load balancing. Um, then once we are uh, load balanced, we, we are hitting apps, right? So those are the, the things you are developing. And here the app needs to have certain characteristics for, for uh, multi-cloud thing, multi-cloud to work. It has to be kind of a 12-factor app. So there's like a whole philosophy there. The app has to be uh, dockerized, otherwise we won't be able to run that in Kubernetes, so uh, maybe a little bit obvious. 
And the application has to be somewhat HTTP based, uh, otherwise uh, you will have difficulties with your CDN providers. And of course the application has to be distributed, so it has to be able to run into an active-active mode. Uh, that's really important, uh, otherwise you'll have uh, consistency issues. So kind of the requirements in the application. It doesn't work for everything, uh, what I'm uh, showing here, but works for some cases and uh, probably good enough. Um, so we have the app at the top, then we have Kubernetes on top, uh, underneath. Um, Kubernetes is like the cloud abstraction layer. It will um, help uh, simplify or make one API uh, that abstracts the infrastructure and make something more developer-centric for, for, uh, to consume. What's really important here is to do uh, one cluster per location, in a, in a, not to do a one giant cluster across different regions. This is really... Uh, important because you remember we have these like resiliency goals so we don't want to stretch our uh, failure domain across uh, the globe so it's really important to do uh, one cluster per location uh, really important there uh, and the kubernetes front will use uh, standard kubernetes constructs things like uh, deployment services ingress uh, <coughs> so uh, the ingress is the way how the the communication from outside happens right um, yeah, and then we'll talk federation in the next slide. Um, so Kubernetes federation, you could think about uh, two different things when you talk about federation in Kubernetes. It depends a little bit if you come from the OpenStack background or if you talk, come from a Kubernetes background. If you come from an OpenStack background, you are probably thinking something like Keystone Federation, where uh, you have one set of credentials that works in different uh, clusters or different regions. Um, uh, so this is possible in Kubernetes. Uh, you can do it either with uh, OpenID Connect or uh, Webhook. Uh, and the like, common way to do it is uh, OIDC, so OpenID Connect. You have two parameters you set on your uh, API servers, this uh, auth URL and client ID. And uh, then it will verify the signatures of the tokens uh, with the, the, the IDP or the identity provider you have selected. So common ones or popular ones are like GitHub, GitLab, Google, uh, all those things are uh, OpenID Connect compatible and they work out of the box uh, with uh, Kubernetes Federation, uh, Kubernetes uh, authentication like that. Uh, on the client side, you need to set some parameters, of course, to, to say who you are, right? Um, and there you have, uh, either you do it manually, there are a set of kubectl commands that you need to set, Oh, there's like a UI you can use that generates the config file and you just drop it in and, and, and it works and you can like, access cluster A and cluster B with the same set of credentials, which makes um, administration very easy. So um, that's one thing you could mean with Kubernetes Federation. The other thing is what uh, they call uh, KubeFed or Ubernetes uh, at the beginning. Uh, and there the idea is one API to rule them all. Uh, so you might you have one API that manages different clusters, Kubernetes clusters, and there there was like two different iterations. They started with uh, v1, kubefed v1, that was kind of discontinued, and they are working on uh, kubefed v2, that is a work in progress. I think they released 0 0.03 recently. Um, v2 requires uh, 1.11 and should be coming out in beta somewhere in Q4 and in GA some time in the future. So there we are a bit stuck in limbo, like if we want to have something like production ready or um, uh, like long term, we are a bit like, okay, what do we do? Do we use the discontinued, discontinued thing or do we do the in development thing? So there it's a bit up to you to see, you know, what you want to do. Is it that you are in early stages of your project? Maybe you do V2 um, or maybe you do something DIY. Like this is always something you can do. Uh, uh, to fill the gap in the meanwhile. So this is what I mean with the uh, Kubernetes Federation. You know, the situation is what it is. Um, and supporting all of that, we have, of course, OpenStack uh, providing the infrastructure. Uh, and there, in day-to-day -day terms, that's like instances, security groups, key pairs, all these kind of things, uh, yeah, floating IPs and, and networks. Uh, and each OpenStack instance or regions will be completely uh, like independent, right? So that's why it's important to have one cluster, one Kubernetes cluster per location and not stretched. Otherwise, we would really like um, 
break the um, isolation models. All right, so that's that for the like architecture. Now I'll talk a little bit about the, the tooling that's necessary to make all of that happen. There are like lots of mo moving parts, so let's explore that a little bit. I'll start from the bottom, like the infrastructure. Um, there you have three popular options to, to set up your uh, OpenStack VMs and all that. Um, you could start, I will start with the uh, Heat, which is the, the OpenStack native project, and uh, that, that works great, but it's uh, OpenStack only, right? So I if you want to do multi-cloud with uh, some OpenStack cloud and some non-OpenStack cloud, Maybe Heat is not the best for that because Heat will not work in AWS or uh, Google Cloud. Um, heat has a little bit of a smaller ecosystem. It's difficult to find on GitHub. Um, heat templates that are generic enough that they will work in different clouds. So that's really a challenge there. If you have like expertise in house to use Heat, like, go for it. Uh, if you are OpenStack only deployment, you know this is really a good tool. But it's not for everybody. Um, another tool that you could use is uh, Ansible, and Ansible does lots of stuff. Here I'm really talking about the cloud modules in Ansible, uh, OS underscore server, for instance, that uh, helps you to pop up VMs in OpenStack. Uh, Ansible has support for more uh, than just OpenStack, AWS, Google Cloud, VMware, stuff like that. So you can really do uh, cross, uh, like, multi-cloud across different providers. That's, that can be interesting. Ansible is like a popular tool, so you might already know about it, you might already have lots of expertise in there, so it's, a, it's a, not a bad choice. Uh, and finally, a popular choice is Terraform, and Terraform, oh, compared to uh, Ansible, that does lots of stuff in cloud modules is one part of it. Ansible Terraform is really focused on infrastructure as, a, as code, so this is really like the focus of Terraform. And as such, it has a bit like more advanced features that you might want, like uh, dry run capabilities. And, uh, this is what I'm about to do. Do you confirm or not? And so on. Um, has support for lots and lots of uh, platforms and really exotic stuff. So uh, you know, this is something to consider if you're planning to use some exotic platform uh, that are not supported elsewhere. So kind of pick your poison, uh, whatever fits you uh, most uh, or best. Uh, just be aware that there are pros and cons in uh, each uh, category. Um, now that we have our uh, infrastructure up, we're going to need to install Kubernetes on top of that, right? Um, like for the infrastructure, you have the, the OpenStack native project for that, that's Magnum. And um, so it's OpenStack only as well, so if you are planning to do Google Cloud, it's not gonna, you're not going to be able to use Magnum in uh, non-OpenStack clouds. And the ecosystem is, uh, is growing, but it's uh, early stages. It doesn't have an uh, Ansible cloud module, I think, for instance. So uh, maybe it will come, maybe there's a pull request in progress for it, but it's not, uh, it's still, uh, not all the tooling is not there. So it's something to consider. If you're thinking to do uh, AWS plus uh, OpenStack, what you could do is use uh, Magnum for your OpenStack side and then COPS for the AWS side, since COPS is a AWS only tool. So you know, that's one option as well. You could mix tools to, to make it work. Uh, Rancher is an op another option that's, uh, I think, Google Cloud, Azure, and uh, AWS doesn't really have OpenStack support out of the box. Um, so. No, that's another option if you want to do multi-platform, uh, multi-vendor uh, solutions. And if you want to do something um, completely agnostic, you have KubeSpray that uh, really doesn't care what your um, provider is. It even works on bare metal and VMware, so it doesn't really, uh, like it's really portable. And uh, KubeSpray, that's a set of Ansible playbooks that uh, just deploy uh, Kubernetes, and it comes with a set of Terraform uh, recipes that you can use for OpenStack, so that's kind of neat. You don't need, need to know too much about Terraform to, to get it working. The slides are online, so I put the QR code at the end if you want to like uh, check stuff and this will even take photos. Um, all right, so now it's part where I do the demo, so I hope uh, everything will work out. Um, first, few words about the demo setup so you can understand more like, what's happening, right? 
So I talked a lot about different options and I tried to keep things simple. So I said, let's take DNS round robin. This is you know, very basic, very simple setup. Uh, cube spray uh, to have something really portable. I've used it before, so uh, familiar with it as well. And uh, using the Terraform uh, recipes that are built in cube spray to deploy into OpenStack clouds. Um, on the CI front, I'm using GitLab CI, and GitLab CI is a bit, uh, it's like open core, it's not like fully open source, but it's, you could use whatever CI tool you want, uh, you could use Zool or uh, Jenkins if you, you like, it's basically it's just Docker build, the Helm install, and some like wrapping around it, this is like really the essential part of it. Um, the demo runs on 36 regions now, I, I did one just uh, at launch, so that's, uh, that's cool. It's really quick to like, pop up in your region. And the cloud providers, they are running like, all sorts of different flavors of OpenStack uh, from Havana to Rocky. So in terms of res resiliency, this is kind of interesting. If there's like, a bug in OpenStack that affects you, like, it might not be affecting all the versions, for instance. So in terms of like, resiliency, this is kind of cool. Um, all the source code for the demo is available at the link below. It's all like open source, you can just like, git clone it and stuff if you want. Um, yep. So the demo runs on like lots of regions and I really have to thank all the like, cloud providers that uh, participated. Uh, yeah, so a big thank you to, to, to all the cloud providers and uh, yeah. Run the demo then. All right. Let me increase the thing. So, all right. So, this is the um, GitLab project that has the, the, the GitLab group that has all the projects. There are basically four projects. There's one <coughs> called App, that's just the Hello World application that I'm using for the demo. The one called Clusters, this manages the life cycle of all the Kubernetes clusters, and the rest is just the helpers. Like, Docker image to make things a little bit faster and uh, Helm chart to like, package the application. So really like the important stuff is those two. Um, I'll open the application and what I will do is uh, show you what the application does. So the application is already deployed. I, I said like it's hello world basically and it says uh, yeah, right now we're hitting the Dallas server and uh, we have a photo of uh, that place. So if I open another one, we're gonna oh, hit Dallas again. Let's see. Right, now we're hitting Stuttgart. So I have to like close the browser and open again, otherwise there's some caching happening for a few minutes in the, the web browser, and you know, I don't want that to, to happen. So you have to show what's going on. Now we're hitting Dubai, and I think you get the idea, right? Um, so let's say uh, hypothetically I'm a developer and I want to like update my application and instead of saying hello world, I want to say uh, hello OpenStack Summit or something like that. So I'm gonna just make a commit into the repo. Uh, let's, let's edit that. Um, and of course I'm using the, the wrong URL. So let's say open stack, hello world open stack, submit. Um, and right now I'm gonna commit into master, but you shouldn't do that. You should really use topic branches, but I don't really have time to like go through the whole workflow, right? This is like standard Git uh, workflow. So let's uh, commit. Um, then we'll go check the pipelines, which is the CI part of uh, GitLab. And we see that there's a new pipeline going. And it will take a few seconds. So the, the pipeline setup is we build the application, we run some tests, and then we send it to production. It's a very simple pipeline. I don't have time for like a giant pipeline for the demo, otherwise we'll be sitting here for one hour. Um, so we have basically a build, does Docker build, and then Docker push to the registry, and test runs a Heroku-ish uh, tests to check that the application is listening and stuff like that. And once that's done, it will uh, go into the production phase, which will deploy the application. I made a little bit of a visualization app for that. So um, this is like 
by a map of the world, obviously. And each dot represents one cluster and changes color based on status of uh, both the clusters, so the Kubernetes cluster status and the, the deployment status of the application, right? So um, as soon as the tests and the build uh, are passed, it will start to become blue and uh, start to deploy the application. This takes a little while, so uh, I will keep that like on, on the side and I'll continue with the demo uh, of the kubectl and the Kubernetes Federation, right? Um, so uh, let me put that. Let's focus on Europe, and then I have the terminal there. So in the clusters repo, I have a folder called Kubros. You can just do kubros.sh. You launch that, and then you have um, a URL that you can access. Up and. Here we are redirected to our OpenID provider, which in uh, my demo is uh, gitlab.com, uh, would be whatever your company uses. Uh, yeah, I'm authenticated, I'm already logged in, so otherwise it will ask for credentials. I click down on the config file, then I'll uh, move the config file in place. Up. So download uh, kubectl into dot cube slash config. This is explained in a readme file if you have any, if you wonder. And then uh, we can do kubectl config get context and it will list like all our Kubernetes clusters that are available um, to us. So then maybe we want to see what's going on in uh, Milano cluster, let's say. So we'll get pods into the namespace called app and then dash dash context uh, Milano. And then we see like the upgrade or the update of the application is ongoing. We are terminating a pod and we are creating new containers. Maybe we want to check in uh, Berlin <coughs> cluster. I mean, Berlin cluster uh, things are uh, yeah, there. And we can just change that flag like this. We don't need to relog in. Uh, everything is there to, to start with. So that's kind of uh, neat from a developer perspective. perspective. You can see the status of the app, check the logs or whatever. Um, let's say you want to, you're a bad person and you're like, oh, anyway, let's try to delete that pod. Um, we can do delete pod like this, but uh, there are RBAC rules that in this example make it so I have read-only access to the API only and maybe some admin people have uh, full access, uh, something like that. So uh, we have the uh, deployment of the application still going on. It takes a little bit of time to update like the, all the clusters that are far away. There's a lot of uh, like latency to reach Tokyo and like, places that are far away. Um, the last part of the demo I want to show is, um, I will keep this pipeline open. It's the clusters repo. works. So let's see which cluster we hit here. Warsaw perfect. Right. So this looks nice. It takes a little bit of time to, to load all the jobs in GitLab. Uh, the server is not really like, sized for all these kind of uh, things. Um, so I wanted to show the, the clusters uh, management uh, CI thing. So there's one job per cluster, so you just click play to, dis to deploy it and you click uh, stop to destroy it. So this is kind of the last part of uh, the, the demo I wanted to do. So let's say I'll open a uh, thing. Now we are hitting Montreal 2 cluster, and I'll uh, destroy that cluster if I find it in the list. Montreal 2, I click stop, and then uh, it launches the, the work to, to destroy that cluster. It will update the DNS record, wait for the customers or the sessions to move away from it, and then we are 
uh, then it destroys those, those terraform destroy all the cluster and that's it. Alright. Uh, right, we can see terraform is going now. Yeah. Alright, it's gonna wait sixty seconds for the DNS TTL to pass. And uh, on the map are we still right. And on the map is all green. So everything is deployed. And we can see if I, yes, if I refresh now we are like hello world open stack summit. So that's uh, like all the clusters updated. I, I will not wait for the DNS propagation to, to happen, and we can uh, uh, move on to the conclusions. Uh, so, wrap up about uh, this is that uh, CubeFed V2 is not there yet, but it's coming, so uh, that would be much nicer than to do some uh, CI uh, stuff to, to fix the, the federation. And also that OpenStack uh, interoperability interop is kind of hard. Like each cloud provider on OpenStack has the OpenStack API, yes, but a bit slightly different versions of it. Like some people, they allow neutron routers, some they don't, some they allow floating IPs, some they don't, some they have uh, custom glance images, some they change the default usernames in the glance images, some they use the raw images, the VHD images, QK images. It's kind of a mess to sort out all those details. And uh, as a consumer, you kind of have to think, uh, like, do I want to handle all those exceptions or do I just take the like, common de denominator and uh, go like that? So this is something you have to, like each organization has to, to think about and do a decision there on their own. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it. What I have. Thank you very much uh, for the attention, and we can take uh, questions. Come again. How do I show the map of clusters? Um, so this is just a DIY thing I did. Uh, I hacked in HTML, like it's a leaflet JS API, and I added the uh, coordinates, GPS coordinates of the cluster into a YAML file and mapped it there. So then it queries uh, some API to get the status of different clusters and stuff like that. So it's a very simple thing. Maybe you want to use something more advanced like Grafana or something like that to do something proper. Any other question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, like on the map, you mean? Uh, how do the, okay, how does the CI has permission to deploy the app? All right, how does that work? So um, the access to the Kubernetes cluster, that's done in uh, GitLab. They have settings for that. Uh, you set the API endpoint, the certificate, and the secret, and then it's passed as config file or something in the CI job, and that's it. I think you can do that in uh, any CI system. You pass some environment variable to authenticate to your cluster, and, and that's that. And it's there for you. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, do you use GitLab environments to, to configure things? Yes, you, I do. And we can see that somewhere here. Um, it takes a little, lots of environments to load, so that's the thing. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Sometimes it's uh, fast, sometimes not. Right, so you see all the environments like this, and you can redeploy them and see the status, the, the last deployments, and things like that. Yeah. All right, all right, that's it then, I guess. <laughs>